Good evening and Merry Christmas to everyone joining us live on Twitch. I'm Joe and this is Show Media's Time and Moments in Passing official wrap-up podcast. So yeah, I mean, if you're joining us for the first time, we're kind of sad that you're only joining now, but we're a trio of guys hosting a virtual film festival throughout December. If you missed out on the festival this time, don't worry because you can go back and listen to all of our previous podcasts on the channel. Uh, and because we've had a blast doing this one, we will definitely be returning in 2021 for a new film festival. So stay tuned for that news. If you're joining us from our social media platforms, thanks for following and supporting us over the past month. We, we really appreciate it. And if you're joining us from our link tree, do make sure you go and check out our social media pages. Stay up to date with all the latest at Shoal. As always, click on our logo and that will take you to all the links and show us some support. Joining me for the last time today is Charlie. Hello. And Connor. Hello. As always, you can check our individual letterbox profiles by following our handles and see what kind of films that we're watching over the festive period. I mean, what you can I say? That, you saying the last time, this joining us the last time is really ominous. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie and Connor are going to die and I'm going to carry on. I know. On <laughs> That's it. I, I'm, I'm, doing a, I'm doing a John Lennon. You know. <laughs> As you Going probably... off with Yoko. <laughs> That's amazing. So every day leading up to Christmas, we have been picking a film for everyone to watch at home. Uh, and each week, each week, we've been live on Twitch to talk about them. And just so our listeners at home are aware, this podcast has been pre-recorded due to some uh, Christmas travel arrangements and obviously making sure that we're spending some good time with our families. But that's not to say that we aren't going to give you a good podcast. So gents, you know, it's the final podcast of the festival. How are we feeling? Oh man, it's been a, a, a ride, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, been it's lovely. Been, it's been it's been a lot of fun. I've been very Christmassy now, though. It's nice. Yeah, I know. Yeah, obviously we're recording this uh, a week before Christmas, and now I f it, I feel like it's Christmas Eve now. We're doing this. Yeah, I, mean, I feel like I should have a uh, like a a fire on in the background, <laughs> like a glass of Bailey's, and I'm like, I'm you know. I should bring up YouTube yeah. on on the stream and and get the fire going. <laughs> for yeah, our listeners yeah, to yeah. watch <laughs> uh, obviously we've got some great films to talk about for the last podcast you probably have noticed they're all Christmassy we've got Die Hard Love Actually and It's a Wonderful Life three very and, different Christmas films and, and yeah kind of wanted to talk about what did you want to talk about kinda? bonus film <laughs> I, I've, I've managed I've managed to get in one of my favourite Christmas films which is Whippet's Christmas Carol I've just managed to like put it in there even though it wasn't when originally we were in there, we're... <laughs> yeah Good. that's fine um Connor, you wanted to do something special for the debate, for the last debate. Uh, instead of yeah, it being so... like uh, <laughs> selling a film to each other, you wanted to talk about, well, I'll let, you, I'll let you talk about it. Yeah, yeah. So I thought everything else is Christmassy themed, so this, this better be as well. So I'm going to ask you guys, what makes a Christmas film a Christmas film? And I'm going to ask you to give me some examples of Christmas films to support maybe maybe you've got some hot takes and you need to support them with examples too oh so okay you. okay so can i go first is that all right yeah please because i have nothing yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay so i've sort of gone with like a bit of a checklist of what i oh, okay. like, oh, sort of needs to be prepared. included to make it oh but i thought i'm gonna i'm gonna win this one <laughs> well, i'm not letting you beat me the it's only the one, one you're winning <laughs> the last one i've got to win it uh so I thought the first thing is like setting or like uh like time period of like in the year, like in the yeah. year calendar. It's gotta be like the lead up to the holiday season. Like yeah. that's gotta be one. Mm -hmm. Uh usually the film is like based on tradition, be that Christian holiday or uh I don't know, Hanukkah or any other or uh, Thanksgiving, something like that, right? Yeah. And through that tradition, it's always usually solidly based in a genre and doesn't break convention or experiment with yeah, like, okay. the mixing of genres. It usually solidly situates itself within one and sticks yeah. to it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also like hope usually has to try out evil in some way throughout the film. Yeah. Uh, snow. That's all I thought for that bit. Snow. Snow. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's usually an exchange of presents, okay. either <laughs> metaphorical or real. Yeah. Uh, and then characters usually have an extreme, uh, like emotional regard for the holiday season. Like 
it'd be that they love it or they hate it. And then throughout the film, they usually switch to the opposite side of you and then land somewhere in the middle at the end. And then the last mm-hmm. one is the family unit coming together as a whole, again, be that metaphorically or real. Wow. There you go. That's my checklist of Christmas. Wow, you really, uh, yeah, I like that. It was methodical. It was good. I like it. Beat that one, Joe. Well, I, I mean, I would argue that any film set in or around Christmas can qualify as a Christmas film. And I think how I can back that up is we've included Die Hard in the, in, in, in the roster of films for the festival. And yet you have to ask yourself the question, would Die Hard work as a film without the element of Christmas? And I would argue that it does, absolutely. So, yeah, I agree with that, but it also fits like most of my checklist mm. for a Christmas film. Yeah. Even though I don't probably think, I like to argue that it isn't because that annoys people. But yeah. uh, mm-hmm. especially Emerson, I like to say that it's not a Christmas film and that really gets him. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> it's weird how all those things that I've said, like that film probably does check all those boxes. Yeah. Like it's based on or solidly based in a genre. Hope, Trials, yeah. Evil. Yeah. Is there snow? There probably is snow. I mean, it's it's LA, so there's... Uh, is there... Well, no, there's not the snow. Space. Don't they... Um, they kind of get around that because there's, like, debris falling from the building, I think, at the end to, like, you know, there's a bit of a joke uh, okay. about the, you know, All right, well, what about there. something like uh, You've Got Mail with Tom Hanks? Because you know, that that, 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 that but... checks a lot of those... Um, a lot of those lists, you know, it's, it's, a uh, so Tom Hanks works for this giant bookstore uh, called Fox books. And he falls in love with this girl who owns like a small independent family owned like corner bookshop. Uh, so it, it is more just about the drama. Um, but most of the film is set in and around Christmas, but it's famously known as not being a Christmas film because it, yeah, it's set at Christmas, but it doesn't. It doesn't. It's like it doesn't care that it's Christmas. Yeah, right. Yeah. So you've got ones like that, and then Iron Man three as well. Iron Man three is set at Christmas time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's got all the hope, triumph, and evil. Yeah, exactly. Got the, snow. Yeah. the exchange of gifts as well. Like he gives the he gives yeah. the boy the new, you know, the thing at the end. The yeah, yeah. Um, obviously. It's weird. Yeah. Uh, country, sorry. No, I was just gonna say, obviously, Die Hard's on that kind of list as well. It's set at Christmas time. Um, Gremlins, that's a that's a very famous one. Right. Yeah, I wouldn't. Somebody was talking about this the other day, and Gremlins isn't like a lot, I feel like a lot of people as well say a Christmas film is a Christmas film just because it's on at Christmas on TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, that yeah, yeah. That doesn't qualify it for me. That just that's just a film you watch at Christmas. Do you know what I mean? Okay, I've got a question for you, lads. Then what's a what's a Christmas film that isn't a Christmas film? But makes you feel very festive. And mine is any time a Harry Potter film comes on, because you can guarantee at some point throughout the film, Ron, Hermione, and 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 Harry will get like a butter beer and sit in front of a toasty fire, and they'll be like <laughs> floating, like Christmas baubles and and stuff. Because you know, Christmas at Hogwarts looks magical. Yeah, so that always yeah, makes yeah, you feel yeah. super festive. But I, what's a movie that makes you feel festive that shouldn't? Oh. I mean, because I think, of the con- because of the content of the film, or because of my experience watching it. Let's go with both. That's true. That's true. So I've got, in yeah. that case, I've got two answers. Okay, because you interestingly you mentioned you know there are films that are on only at Christmas time which aren't Christmas films. So yeah, let's hear yours, uh, Connor. Yeah, right. Go well, uh, I'm trying to think of one for the content of the film, but a film that's like not at all Christmassy, but like. Um, the original Star Wars trilogy made me think of Christmas because of the kind of family film that's on TV at Christmas that I would mm-hmm. always watch because I love Star Wars. But, you know, there's no way I'm going to argue that Star Wars is a Christmas film, but it's one that makes <laughs> me kind of feel Christmassy, I guess, in a way. Yeah, the sand dunes the of Tatooine don't really scream, yeah. you know, it's a wonderful life, do they? I guess, I guess, like things like Toy Story and stuff that are on at, um, at Christmas too, they kind mm-hmm. of make me feel Christmassy. Maybe it's just a more of a family, um, you know, because they're a family film. Christmas is a family period. I guess maybe that's why. Animated films in general are pretty Christmassy. Yeah, I'm I'm interested to hear yours, Charlie. So, um, what well, I was going to say, uh, about time, mm, really yeah. gives me that vibe of like, yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, then any Richie Curtis film, really. Yeah. <laughs> so I feel I don't know. I, yeah, he's quality. I really like Richie Curtis. Mm-hmm. But maybe it's that whole thing about like it's just wholesome, isn't it? And it's mm-hmm. doesn't really offend anyone. It's just sort of about love, you know, which I really quite like. Um, mm-hmm. but also uh, it's a film called Napoleon by ah, yes. Abel Gantz or whatever his name is. Uh, from like nineteen twenty seven. It's like six hours long, and me and Dad always put it on, <laughs> put it on in the background while we're opening presents on Christmas morning. And it's just oh, like it's like a nice little tradition of ours where we just sort of have that on in the background. We don't really pay much attention to it, but it's mm-hmm. always on. So that's yeah, that that's feels. really nice. And it, yeah. Like the um, if it's like the prologue or the the very like first scene, they're outside in the schoolyard, and it's just like these um, schoolboys having like a a war, but with snowballs. So it's like this whole grand fight, but they're all fighting with snowballs and they've built like forts and like walls out of snow and stuff. It's amazing. Like that Mm. scene is really like really cool. I think um, I'm thinking about Connor, you said about the Star Wars trilogy. I think I have a similar thing with Lord of the Rings. I remember being very young and uh, they were always on, you know, because I I couldn't afford like the DVD box set when I was little. So um, it would always be on ITV or or on BBC at some point. So and those films always make me feel so warm and cozy. Yeah. Uh, definitely Lord of the Rings for me there. Yeah. yeah. Again, like with those films though, Star Wars and Lord of the Rings, it's like the journey is mm-hmm. so like by the time you get to the end, it's like really wholesome. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. you get that yeah. speech from you know, you get all those little speeches from Gandalf scattered throughout. Yeah. It just really like warms your heart, doesn't it? A bit. I've got quite a, a niche one, actually. Um, it'll make sense. I think Charlie will guess what it is straight away. But uh, the musical Rent, for oh, me, yeah. is uh, it's, it's, it's set at Christmas time. If you're not familiar with Rent, it's one of my favorite musicals. I was actually in a production of it a couple of years ago. Uh, and it's essentially Friends, but with AIDS, <laughs> if that makes sense. So oh. it's, it's about a bunch of uh, Manhattanites. They all live together. There's There's about six or seven of them. Uh, but it's set in 1989 on Christmas Eve. And so it's incredibly Christmassy, but it's during the height of the AIDS crisis. So there's, you know, love and loss and there's gay characters, there's there's trans characters. Um, and it, yeah, that always makes me feel really, really festive because there's some, the whole like light motifs throughout the musical is all very Christmassy. All right. So I really like that one. I'll do. Uh, I'll, to, I'll see a production of that sometime. Mm-hmm. I, I do like a good. I do like a good musical. There's yeah. It. There's a film adaptation yeah. of it by Christopher Columbus. Uh, what's his name? Is it Chris Columbus? Yeah, I know he's got a very similar name. Um, yeah, Chris Columbus, American film director. He did a few of the Harry Potter films. I right. And yeah, he Wait, directed no, the. Not the Christopher. Not, Columbus, not the right? Christopher Columbus. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Chris. Chris Columbus. He's an American film director and. He did the film adaptation of it, and it's it's questionable. It's uh, I mean, Rent was known for being very cutting edge and edgy back in the 1990s yeah. when it when it hit Broadway, and when it was translated to film in 2005, it was kind of um, made a little bit more family friendly, right. which kind of takes away some of the meaning of it. So I would say, like... sorry, go on. no, please, yeah, go on. Uh, I was just going to say about like how theatre generally, I always think is a bit more edgy. Mm, yeah, than other forms of entertainment, especially visual ones like film. And exactly, stuff. like so many so, of those kind of Manhattan set musicals or something like Chicago, unless yeah. they really want to commit to the adult content, it's really there's not much point in in, in adapting it. But anyway, I think as well, um, like budget wise, if they, mm. they want to make that money at the cinema, they've got to make it sort of yeah. friendly to families and all that, haven't they? To make money yeah. in the box office really realistically yeah. Yeah. but if you do get a chance to watch it that you can get the 2008 broadway copy which actually feels a lot more christmasy than the film so i would definitely yeah. recommend that it's, it's a professional recording so yeah that's another christmas movie that makes me feel very festive even though it's not really focused on christmas nice yeah I like that. It's a good example. charlie so, yes it's the uh the last podcast, and it's the last opportunity you have to embarrass me and Connor with our letterbox ratings. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that I won that that debate, though. Oh, just clarify well. that. 
for the audience oh, and myself. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, we we got a little bit sidetracked. Uh, <laughs> you did win that one, Charlie. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'll cherish that moment. There we go. That's your Christmas present. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <laughs> right. Let's embarrass you then. Okay. Well, or maybe embarrass myself as well. We'll see. Um, so I've got. How many have I got here? Six. We'll just go through them. Uh, so Grinch. Someone's rated it three point five. Um, I'm going to say that's you, Chaz. Yeah, okay. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm a fan of that film. But I'm going to say you, Chaz, as well. That was Connor. Yeah. So. Right. Okay. Yeah. No, I can, I can see that. Uh, Connor, we're having a little bit of uh, technical yeah. lag from you a little bit, so we'll just carry on me and Chaz for a sec. Right. Uh, let's do Home Alone. Two point five. Oh, as in not Home Alone 2. Oh, oh, no, sorry, right. Home Alone. <laughs> Someone's rated it 2.5. <laughs> Home Alone 2.5. Someone's rated Home Alone 2 0.5 stars. <laughs> <laughs> um, Home Alone 2.5. I want to say that's me, because I think yeah. the more I've watched them, the more I've realised that they're a secret prequel to the Saw movies and that Kevin McAllister is a messed up child. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that that was you, Joe. Was yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's true. It's true. And uh, I think uh, uh, the guy that plays Kevin McAllister, he went on the Jimmy Kimmel show or Jimmy Fallon, one of the Jimmys. Uh, <laughs> and right. they got talking about the film theory and said that it, well, he he believes it. He believes that it's a prequel to Saw. That because of the abandonment issues and the relationship with his parents and his kind of tendency to torture robbers that try and break into his home you know he, he becomes jigsaw from the storm <laughs> that's movies. amazing I that's know. such a good theory <laughs> i know it works as well yeah um yeah all right next one so santa claus conquers the martians someone's rated at 0. 0.5 <laughs> i've never heard that i've never even heard yeah, of it so. this sounds incredible it's <laughs> yeah it's me yeah it's it's so it's so bad but it's like amazing at the same time that it even ever got made. It's incredible. That's Basically, like Santa saves saves Christmas for the Martians and, and stuff. It's, <laughs> it's amazing. Do the, the Martians Wait, celebrate he's... Christmas? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Do they save it with the Martians or do they save it against the Martians? Well, at first he saves Earth against the Martians and then he sort of wholesomely saves Christmas for the Martians. Right. Yeah. It's incredible. You, that, you incredible really, piece of you've kind of sold it to me, actually. <laughs> I mean, you've got to watch it. It's one of those where it's like that bad that you've got to watch it. <laughs> 0. 0.5. Okay, but anyway. Amazing. What's the next one? Uh, we've got Love Actually. Three stars. Oh, I quite like Love Actually, as we'll find out. So that might be me. And then I'm uh, not sure. I I don't know. I can't see I can't see it being Connor. It's fair. Yeah, it was me. Was it you? Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh Connor is know, just but... having some technical difficulties, so he'll be back in just a sec. But Charlie and I uh, are gonna carry on. We'll uh we'll carry it. Uh so Muppets four stars. Muppets Christmas Carol, sorry. Oh, that's definitely Connor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's 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 tried his very hardest to worm this film into the festival. Into every aspect of the uh <laughs> the, the production. Yeah. You know, I'm gonna miss doing these ratings. <laughs> Have we got one more for uh, me? One more. This is the last one of the uh okay. the entire program festival thing. Uh it's Elf three stars. Ah, uh, see, who doesn't like Elf? That's my question. So that's really hard to answer. Unless... Ah, I kind of want to say Connor might be a bit of a stick in the mud with Elf. I see him not liking Will Ferrell that much, but I might be wrong. This is amazing. It's you, mate. Is it me? Yeah. Oh, three <laughs> yeah. stars is still good. No, yeah, but it's just that, yeah. I don't know, the way you were hyping it up then, you were like, oh, it's going to be like a five-star <laughs> film. <laughs> it is. It is a good film. I like it. It's good, yeah. Yeah, it's one of those where like you watch it, 
and you're like, oh, that was really good. And then you, you leave it a few, you know, till next year and you're like, mm. halfway through the year, like, oh, I didn't really like Elf. It's not that great. Here's a really but, weird um, psychological thing about Elf. No one can remember Zoe Deschanel being in it. <laughs> because, and I would argue it's because she has blonde hair. Like, we all know Zoe Deschanel to have black hair with the bangs, you know? Yeah. yeah and yeah. I just, I can't remember. Like, um, my girlfriend's a big fan of New Girl. And she watches that oh, right, quite a yeah. lot. And uh, and I had to remind her that Zoe Deschanel was in Elf. And then, you know, the penny dropped. The light bulb went on. Right, it's, yeah, like yeah. The, it's like the Mandela effect. No one can remember her being yes, in Elf. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like she's invisible when she cuts her hair in any other way that is, you know, the bangs, black hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there we are. That's our last ratings for the festival. Oh, I won that out a little tear. I know, I know. <laughs> we'll bring really... it back for the next one, definitely. I think. Yeah, we'll do um, we'll do IMDb though. Do it out of ten. Okay, if, right. If we can. Yeah, we can just transfer, like transfer it, can't we? Yeah, we can do. Okay, yeah. so obviously, the last few films of the festival, we tried to make them nice and festive. It was really hard to choose what film to do for the final film, but. It's a wonderful life, I think. It's it's a it's a fitting end to time and moments in passing because indeed the whole film is, you know, about George Bailey realizing coming coming to realise that even though he may feel quite depressed and that he hasn't done much with his life, he's touched so many people's souls. And yeah. Uh, it's one big flashback, isn't it? It is, film? yeah, yeah. And it, it's a wonderful use of it's a very it's magical a film. Life. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a wonderful life. <laughs> Uh, O'Connor, welcome back. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll see how things. You sound much better. Don't worry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's it's kind of on and off. There's not much I can do about it. It's so all just soldier on. In, in no, that's Christmas okay. Christmas spirit will carry on. <laughs> yep, indeed. So yeah, it's we were just about to say, Connor. Uh, it's a wonderful life. We a hard film. It, it's it's hard to pick a last film for anything, but it's a wonderful yeah, life yeah. seems quite fitting for well one Christmas and two for time and moments in passing. Yeah, it's yeah, and like you can't really end on a more wholesome film, can you? Either you want to end on something good like that. Mm -hmm. I, I think pick anything more there's, wholesome. There's like I was reading um, a book by David Thompson, who's a film critic, and uh, he said that there's like two ways to view the film. This can either be like a blissful dream of love and and like all this hopefulness, mm -hmm. or you can even see it as like a nightmare, like based around the corruption. Uh, of like capitalistic ideas and like mm. how that will eventually lead to, to like suicide and death. But and it like just depends on your viewpoint of what you take from the film. Yeah. I think it'd be, it, I think it can be in the modern sense of mental health. It can be quite a triggering film for a lot of people. Yeah. 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 I, I know I, I definitely sympathize with George towards the end of the film. And, and, and there are some moments in it where I, you know, my heart is, is in pieces for him. Uh, yeah. Obviously, that you know Jimmy Stewart's performance is just perfect in every way. Yeah, definitely. Uh, he really helps carry that. But yeah, I I, I completely agree. It can be seen in so many different ways. It's, but... it's it's definitely an indictment on capitalism and you know people being heavily materialistic. Even if you know you can take it, it can still be a wholesome film and it can still critique those things as well. I think, can't mm -hmm. it? Yeah. I think uh, it's it's um, weird to think that after this, Capra turned the director Frank Capra. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he turned into a bit of a like a um, into a bit of a putter out of the film. Actually, he turned Did into he? like really? he was a bit before it. He was a bit like uh, you know on George Bailey's side, and he just mm -hmm. sort of turned very capitalistic after it. I think and very Hollywood. Do you know what I mean? Like that's, that's really sad. Yeah, yeah, a bit yeah. like Christopher Nolan. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> had to get had to get that in there at the end of the festival. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, whenever I describe, so I, I watched it recently with my house, and, and they were all sort of asking me what was Potter's deal, and I just said, "This is Donald Trump before he was born." Yeah. So essentially, it's yeah. still yeah, yeah. Um, it's um, Charles Foster Kane. It's like there's so many of those characters that we can say Potter mm -hmm. is in in real life. Or even in fictional yeah. characters as well. But on a less depressing note, it, the the film does <laughs> yes, have yeah, a yeah. very a very lovely, uplifting message. Um, and so I've actually got a bit of trivia here. 
but I want you to guess what what the answer is. So, uh, It's a Wonderful Life was ranked number one on a American Film Institute list back in 2006, but what was it voted number one for? Do we have any idea? Oh, uh, can I can I get my guess in? I've, I've thought of something. Yeah, go for it. Is it the film that makes the most people cry? No, it's not. But that's a good that's a good idea. Yeah, that that, that probably mm. is probably number one. Like, might be. <laughs> um. Oh, would it be if uh the least expensive? I don't know. Hollywood <laughs> film, something like that. I don't know. No, I'm gonna say Connor was closer in the sort of emotional aspect. Oh, go on. You give up? Is it oh, like number one are... film to represent mental health problems? No, but you're kind of close. Are we on suicide. Are we suicide? Are we like you can keep showing guessing suicide if you want. on film. No, it's not that deep. Okay. Yeah. Um. Is it just is it just the most wholesome film ever made? Is that what the list is? I'm I'm gonna say that's pretty close. It's yeah, it's ranked as the number one most inspirational movie of all time by the American Film Institute. Wow. Yeah. That's nice. mental. I like that. Which is uh, yeah, I don't disagree with that. I think it is a very inspirational film. It's depressing for like ninety nine percent of it, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> gets to that last scene. <laughs> uh, here's a bit of trivia that will actually blow your minds, uh, and I didn't tell you about this trivia before we started recording because I really want to get your reaction. Okay. This, so Bedford Falls is uh, completely fictional, obviously, uh, but the entire town, as in like the main like high street and all of that, it is a full set. There, oh, it, well, it wasn't what? a real town at all. So the set for Bedford Falls, it was constructed in two months. It's the longest set that had ever been made for an American movie at the time, and it was four acres. It had wow. 75 wow. real stores and buildings, a main street, a factory district, and a large residential and slum area. Main street was 300 yards long, which took up the, sort of the same space as three whole city blocks, and it was all built. This is a, there's that awesome shot... Uh... When he's running back from the town, isn't there? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but it yeah, does, so yeah. that, that mm-hmm. means they must have, because it happens when it turns into Pottersville in the film as well, doesn't yes. it? That shot. Yeah, yeah. So they must have, like, redressed the whole set. Yep, it was not on location. That was an entire set. Wow. That's mad. So, yeah. So, Charlie, would, would you like to take back your guess of the cheapest? Um, yeah. Film? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Definitely. Wow. Because that, that's mental. Mm. Like, just do it on location, surely. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Be so much cheaper. <laughs> yeah. I guess, I guess maybe would it have been cheaper to build their own set as opposed to going to a location and having to put up signs, yeah, uh, and then also having to put up a second load of signs for when the angel comes down yeah. and yeah, turns it into Pottersville, maybe. You're also yeah. under more you're under more pressure, aren't you? Because if, you, if you're shutting down a town, you, mm. you can only do it for a certain amount of time. Mm-hmm. If you've got that, your own yeah. set, if you've got your own set, you've got free reign, really. That's true. And they must have had a lot of extras. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I remember, I do remember Bedford Falls being really busy anytime they're on the high street. There's so many people in the street. Yeah. 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 I I, I wouldn't have I would not have guessed that that was a set at all. Mm-hmm. That's good. It's really well done. The set design yeah. is amazing. <laughs> it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. They basically built a whole town. They should have just left it and made it be a town. Yeah. yeah. Kind of yeah. like how Peter Jackson left Hobbiton standing. Yeah. And now yeah, you can exactly. go and stay in it and it's a hotel now, I think. <laughs> That's on my bucket list. Definitely. Yeah. That would be so good. Uh, add Bedford Falls to your bucket list. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so there we go. It's a wonderful trivia. Hey. 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 There we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So it's a wonderful life. Amazing performance by. Jimmy Stewart, uh, and what you may not know about Jimmy Stewart is he was he was a war veteran, and he oh, like. Like, yeah he, he was in World War Two, so he he actually found a lot of the scenes to do with his brother Harry quite difficult to perform, uh, yeah. just the the emotion, um, and something quite funny here is, is uh, James Stewart was so nervous about the kissing scene because it was his first kiss since he returned to Hollywood after the war. 
Uh, so he hadn't kissed a woman in years because he'd, he'd been over in Europe and, and wherever. Yeah. Um, and to get a really realistic reaction, uh, you know the scene in which they, they he kisses Mary in the house for the first time yeah. when he's all stressed. Basically, he he was stressed because of the kiss. And they would, that was just a rehearsal. They were just rehearsing the lines. That's why it's a little bit weird and out of place as to why right. he's feeling oh, yeah, really okay. stressed. Um, so they were rehearsing the scene and they have the guy on the phone as well. Um, the guy in New York or wherever it is. Sam. And Sam. yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but basically under Frank Capra's watchful eye, um, he filmed the scene unknowing to Stuart. Uh, in only one unrehearsed take so cool. it, it works really well and, and the part of the embrace as well is is really real and passionate and and you know full of nerves which were real because james stewart hadn't kissed a woman in like four or five years yeah wow. Cause he, yeah because this that's, was 1947 wasn't it, it was only two, two yeah. years after the end yeah, of the war so um i mean that that's what a great director can do though isn't it they can just channel whatever mm-hmm. Whatever they're given into just great performances. Yeah. Yes. I yeah, I actually have a funny story about that on Alien. Uh the slap that Sigourney Weaver gives the other um the other lead, the other female character. That wasn't in the script and Ridley Scott just No, it wasn't no, it's not Sigourney Weaver. No, the, there's the character that slaps Sigourney Weaver, isn't there? Right. Yeah. yeah and yeah, um think... and that was not in the script at all. Wow. Yeah, Ridley Scott just said, when Sigourney walks through the door to start the scene, slap her. <laughs> so Sigourney Weaver's reaction when she tries to slap her back and beat the shit out of her is completely real. That's so awesome. yeah, I, I love it when directors like, just do that stuff. It's a bit like that scene in Lord of the Rings where uh, Aragorn, what's his name, kicks the mm. helmet. Well, uh, you know what? Like... Yeah, for next festival, we'll do films that have improvisation. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good one in Lord of the Rings. So it, didn't he actually like break his toe or his foot or something? Because when he kicked, he kicked yes. it, it was like yeah, and the scream yeah. he made was real. I love mm-hmm. that. Yeah, and they kept it in. <laughs> they kept it in. Um, do I have any more trivia for you? Do I have any more wonderful trivia? Yeah, uh, wonderful. What was it? It's a wonderful trivia. It's a wonderful trivia. Yeah. It's a wonderful uh, trivia. Nice. There we go. Um, and then after that, we're going to do trivia, actually. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but I'll just wrap Muppets up this trivia. Life. Oh, yeah, we go. <laughs> Muppets Christmas trivia. Yeah, yeah. Um, the scene in which George prays in the bar just before he goes to the bridge, James Stewart was so overcome with emotion that he began to sob. So the crying is is real. Because he wow. had um, he'd had similar moments during the war. In which he, he right. you know, he he felt a little bit suicidal, um, which is awful, uh, and obviously he started to remind him of that. So there's an interesting shot in which uh, the only camera available was Frank Capra's very small, like handheld camera that he that he just had to like, you know, as like a like a rehearsal camera, yeah. right, so right. that he can see what things look wanted to what he wanted things to look like. Yeah, and yeah. George uh, James Stewart was just rehearsing at the bar, and again he started to cry. So Frank Capra filmed it very quickly with that camera, and that's why it's very grainy compared to the rest of the film because it was as uh-huh. much it was a much smaller um, film stock. So he blew the shot up because he wanted to catch that real expression on Stewart's face, and that's why the shot looks so grainy compared to the rest of the film. But uh-huh. yeah, again Frank Capra doing bits for. <laughs> Jimmy Stewart. <Yeah. laughs> He's a real singer. If, if he told him that, like, before the film was released, or like he just got into the premiere and he just saw that those scenes and was like, oh, they, they recorded that bit. Maybe. I mean, <laughs> it's not unheard of for directors just to do things and then for actors to be very surprised when they go to the premiere. It's uh, mad, isn't it? The you most, think yeah. Be in like their contract or something where they have like mm. final say of how they're presented. Yeah, I suppose well, it's the director's vision, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the most famous instance of a director keeping something from an entire cast was probably uh, "I Am Your Father" from *The Empire Strikes Back*. Um, right. The only person yeah. who knew about that was James Earl Jones, who voiced it, and uh, George Lucas and Mark Hamill. Wow. So when they got to the cinema, Mark Hamill was sat next to Harrison Ford, and everyone in the cinema heard the line 
And Harrison Ford, being you know the grumpy bastard that he is, just turns to Mark Hamill and is like, "You never told me that." <laughs> <laughs> and was really mad at him. Yeah, so, yeah. It's, I I doubt Capra told Jimmy Stewart about a lot of yeah. things, uh, and that's why I think it's such a it's such a wonderfully naturalistic performance, especially because a lot of films of that era are very the performances are very hyper real as opposed to yes, naturalistic. Yeah. That's very much the style yeah. of uh, yeah, exactly. Of golden Hollywood, there's, isn't there's, it? There's still a huge hangover from theatric because there's a lot of theatrical actors came over and Hollywood mm-hmm. isn't there, so there's kind of a, a hangover from that. And yeah, film acting hasn't really taken on its own life yet, I guess. By that time, yeah, exactly. I feel like uh, it's also a hang up from silent era where everything was so exaggerated because you don't oh, yeah, have yeah. exposition from. Any, movement any was before. still a little bit more important than voice, wasn't it? I would say. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. definitely. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, it's a wonderful life. What well, I think a great film to end the festival on. Uh, actually, I've got a really nice story about it's a wonderful life. The first time I ever watched it, I put it on at a very random time on Christmas Eve because I had nothing to do. My mum just said, "We've had the DVD of this. Go and watch it." So I started watching it and just by sheer luck and coincidence the film finished at bang on midnight nice. so it, it turned That's christmas so day just as just as the credits started to roll it was oh, christmas okay. day so I, I i i've always kept that with me in my heart whenever i've watched it because nice. it made me feel a, yeah made me feel very festive That's such anyway. a good first year and experience for a film oh yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah um Jealous. love actually <laughs> love actually love yeah. actually uh trivia actually Trivia, actually. <laughs> I uh, I didn't used to like this film, and it's really grown on me. To be, okay, to be what, quite why, what was your why? What was your reason for not? I liking? wasn't a massive fan of rom coms, and right. I felt like this was just like the ultimate rom com. Um, mm. But since I've watched it a lot more as an adult, I've really come to love the like the nuances of the performances, especially like Alan Rickman. And Emma Thompson, um, I just yeah, I I do like the sort of interconnecting stories. It's a little yeah. bit unrealistic still, but you know, with the prime minister and all that. Uh, and I guess I'm not the biggest fan of Hugh Grant. But Actually, I don't yeah. think he has. Uh, well, I don't think anyone has a central role in it, which I I think is really nice. Yeah, is not that, even uh, is... Liam Neeson. I thought yeah. you were going to say, luckily, <laughs> luckily Hugh Grant doesn't listen to our podcast. And I was like, yeah, no, I don't think he does. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you are listening to Hugh Grant, do you want to come on and debate Joe about <laughs> your acting style? Yeah. Uh, the first thing I'll tell him is to uh, to move his bloody top lip. Because he doesn't, you know, especially when he's in Bridget Jones. He's all here, Bridget, Bridget, Bridget Jones. And his top lip can, doesn't uh, move. You can give us <laughs> some voice coaching. I will. Joe. I will. I'm yeah. going to I'm gonna have to whip him into shape. Yeah, that's pro, it. We'll pro, make an actor of him yet, eh? Pro bono voice coaching for him. <laughs> yeah. Um, here's a bit of trivia that will blow your mind about Love Actually. Um, Kira Knightley is incredibly young in this film. Even though her character is depicted as getting married, she's actually only 17. Wow, what? Uh, yeah, in, she's insanely young. Um, just about to go to drama school in real life but uh what's more mind-blowing is that Kira knightley is only five years older than thomas Brody sangster who plays the little kid sam he was 11 slash 12 yeah mental i mean they're they're on opposite sides of puberty but still five years is not a lot <laughs> it's, it's it's really funny that she's on her way to drama school and yeah she's just in a hit film already i know yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and a year later, then she did Pirates of the Caribbean, and she was obviously when she was fourteen, she was in Star Wars. R- really? Yeah. Do you? Yeah, she, yeah. She's um, she's uh, Padme's double. She's like the double, isn't she? Yeah, in the Phantom Menace. Oh wow! Yeah, you know that Padme has a yeah a uh, yeah yeah. I'm trying to think of the right word. Yeah, it's just like a double, like, like a, a distraction. It's like, it's like a, a Saddam Hussein esque double. But <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Prince Saddam Hussein of Naboo. Yeah. Maybe that's where we got the idea from. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay, swiftly Not moving George on. George Lucas. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
obviously also Andrew Lincoln's in the film if you're not familiar with him he went on to be very successful in his tenure on uh, The Walking Dead uh, being a Welsh man to get a hit show in America he did very well but he was obviously quite a lot older at the time than Keira Knightley and he actually argued for quite a while with the, with the director uh, because he didn't want to do the handwritten sign scene Oh, well, uh, because yeah. he just said, you know, this is borderline stalker territory. Uh, yeah. So, I don't know, what do you think about that scene? Oh, see, now you've said that, I can, yeah, it's sort of ruined it for me. But Married when you watch woman it, as well. <laughs> in the context of the film, you're just like, oh, yeah, that's a bit cute, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, that's a bit... mm-hmm. I can, oh, I can... You've ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> I can only think of references to it and memes mm-hmm. and stuff because, like, if someone's gonna, you know, if there was a film made now where someone held up a sign with something on, people have got to paste stuff, different stuff on it, and put it all over the internet. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Jeffrey Epstein didn't kill himself. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, Stop the I'm just trying to think now. Uh, we have two films that both have Alan Rickman in, which I didn't yeah. think about. We do have Die Hard and Love Actually. Alan Rickman, I miss him every day. He's great. Um, uh, I kind of wish he'd done more, uh, more comedy stuff. Like I haven't, I've seen so I've probably not seen a lot of his work, but I, I wish he'd done a lot more comedy stuff. Really, mm-hmm. like I really think he took the channel that. I I mean I'm only familiar with him from Harry Potter and Die Hard and 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 stuff like that. I, and and obviously Love Actually is one of the reasons why I came to love the film a little bit more. I think. I look so to come to love Love Actually more. <laughs> no, no, love, no, love no, joke. I mean, it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure you planned that. No, I, just, I mean, that's how, <laughs> awkwardly, how awkwardly it sounded when I said it. Um, uh, one yeah. thing I really love from Love Actually is the uh, the song. Mm-hmm. The uh, I just think that's so class. The Bill, the whole uh, Bill Nye character is amazing. Oh yeah, that's I forgot Bill Nye yeah. was in it. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He is my old my man favorite. goals. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And that the whole way, yeah. his storyline is amazing. It's great. Yeah, yeah. When he uh, when he stays in on Christmas Eve with his manager. Yeah. It's just cute. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it is a wholesome like, film. Like you said, with his badger. With his badger. Yeah, I mean, I badger. <laughs> no, <laughs> you, I, badger. Yeah, clearly uh, Connor's having more technical difficulties than we thought. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's just like, I thought he is. Yeah. It's not mine this time. There are some, uh, obviously some very famous and familiar faces in the Bachelor, but there's also some quite underrated faces in it as well. One of them being Billy Bob Thornton, who plays the president of the United States. Uh, pretty big actor in, in, the, in the US who went on to do Fargo, which was quite successful. Uh, but yeah. I I have another little quiz question for you here. So um, Billy Bob Thornton has a really unusual phobia of something. And so Hugh Grant would sometimes flash this something. That sounds really wrong, but he he would, you know, so uh, England is known to have an abundance of this sort of thing. Uh, And Billy Bob Thornton has a fear of it, but, between what? takes, Hugh Grant would would what would you know would uh, show it to him, and then he would freak out in amusement. And it's not it's not uh, it is suitable for work, so it's not what you're thinking. So, do you know <laughs> what his unique phobia is? Oh the wow! F- the fact that you've said that England's ha- England has an abundance of it has thrown me off more. I think. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I'm trying to think what we have loads of. <laughs> try and think. Let's try and think yes. what would. <laughs> try and think what would be abundant in Ten Downing Street. Oh God! Yeah, dickheads. Dickheads. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Apart from that. <laughs> um, um. What? This is. Wait. Oh, do you know what I thought what? as soon as you said I was like staples? It's going to be staples. Staples. Oh, wow, that's a good one. <laughs> Well, after you, I was going to say paper clips. We're sort of on the same lines. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay. You're thinking in the right terms of it being, you know, an inanimate object. Um. But think bigger than stationary. <laughs> oh, okay. No, you, you're quite close there, Chas. Okay, I'll, I'll stick with that doorknobs. Okay. Even Connor? though it's not right, I feel like I'm close enough to be. Final guess from Connor. Is it? Is it? Is it fat? 
Wait, doorknobs is closer than staples is. Yeah. Oh god, that's throwing me off more. <laughs> it's just <laughs> gonna be doors, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Going once. Um, doorbells. Doorbells. Going twice. I don't know. No, okay, so uh, Billy Bob Thornton has an unusual fear of antique furniture. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, between takes... How, how's Hugh Grant dangled down his face? <laughs> Hugh Grant would sometimes, like, flash a piece of antique in front of Thornton just before the cameras roll and watch him freak out. <laughs> what an asshole. <laughs> why, why antique furniture? I, just don't I get have no phone. idea. He, he, that is insane. Who looks at, a, like, a really old oak <laughs> chair with, like, a really nice varnish on it and just thinks that's creeping me out it's too shiny like it's that. too glossy that's like that's like such a wide phobia as well that's so many things to be afraid of i know yeah, yeah doors doorknobs antique paper clips <laughs> antique staples, <laughs> antique staples. <laughs> so there we go that's all my true for love actually love trivia love, love I trivia like i think to be fair when I, I it was hard for me to pick some really juicy pieces of trivia for, for trivia actually just because all of it is gold. Uh, I think one off the top of my head is that um, Thomas Brody Sangster's dad is actually a professional drummer, so he was able to teach his son how to play the drums camera reasonable, you know, <laughs> so that it can pass oh, on cool. the screen. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, he didn't know how to play the drums. But since, he has kept it up and is now a pretty good drummer. Nice. That's really cool. Yeah. That's really nice. I like that. That's nice he story. still looks like a child and he's 26, 27. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Interestingly, did anyone catch the? Uh, I think was it Children in Need or Red Nose Day? One, one of those two. Oh yeah, the I've not reunion. Seen it, is it good? Have you seen it's, it? It's good. Yeah, I liked it. I mean, the kid is is. I don't know. He's he's still a kid, but with hair. Like he's got <laughs> right. a beard, but he's still a child. It's very strange. Because uh, Richard Curtis, I think does he did he start Red Nose Day or one of them? Comic Relief, I think he started it. Okay, I didn't know that. So, yeah. so that's that's why I think they did Love Actually. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, or yeah. Red Nose Day, actually, or whatever mm-hmm. it's called. <laughs> right, Die Hard. Die Hard. So I'm going to confess, I've not seen this. <sighs> wow. And the last, the last, the last yeah. podcast as well. You got sorry? Yeah. <laughs> it's the last one as well, and you haven't seen I Die know. Hard. I know. So the... Um, First bit of trivia for Die Hard. The fictional Nakatomi Plaza is actually the headquarters of 20th Century Fox. Oh, but, okay. oh, wow. but what's more bizarre about 20th Century Fox, uh, the headquarters of Nakatomi Plaza, the company actually charged itself rent. <laughs> I know. Why? They were like, yeah, let's let's use our own building and we'll charge ourselves we'll charge ourselves rent. Is it something to do like you write off on tax or something? I don't know. Maybe I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Maybe it saved them money to charge themselves rent in terms of tax. I'm not. Yeah. Sure. No idea. But yeah, there we go. Yeah. Nakatomi Plaza. I'm <laughs> I uh, I never realized for a long time that um, that I had was based on a book. I never realized. Yeah. Do you want to tell our listeners at home what the what the title of the book was? Because I think it's pretty awful. <laughs> it really is. It was just nothing lasts forever. <laughs> which is, which is just, just the most bland. And it's a thr- you know, the the book's very similar. It's like a high octane thriller. Like, why would you name it that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so there you go. There's my there's my very very low octane piece of trivia for you about Die Hard. <laughs> there we go. Uh, trivia hard. Trivia yeah. hard. Yeah, we're going in hard with the trivia. Um, Die trivia. Uh, Bruce, Will- <laughs> uh, Bruce Willis. Bruce Willis. When he rewatches the film, he actually still gets really squeamish whenever he sees the part where his character has to pull the shard of glass out of his foot, which, to yeah, be honest, that... gets me as well. Yeah, it is pretty. Anything with anything with glass is just really hard yeah. to watch, isn't it? No, and um, the costume department had an absolute field day on this film. The costume department had seventeen undershirts in various stages of degradation on hand for Bruce oh. Willis. <laughs> so obviously they they don't sh- they don't shoot films. Seldom do they shoot films in a linear way. So you yeah, know it'd be like, yeah. all right, what scene is this? Okay, well, it's towards the end of the film. Okay, get me the the vest that has like four holes in it and a bit of blood. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah, it's um, a much job to keep tra- to keep track of that as well. Mm-hmm, but yeah, yeah, like a continuity person, don't they? Yeah. Mm, That's yeah. like literally all they do is look for inconsistencies. <laughs> so many vests. <laughs> 
so little time. <laughs> Vest hard. <laughs> pretty cool job though. Yeah, um, I think for a day. <laughs> when you've got to come in every day for six months just to look after some vests <laughs> might get a little bit um, depends how much they paid me yeah true true yeah you sleep, you sleep in one day and the, the crew doesn't have any vests for a whole day's film <laughs> obviously um die hard kind of for me brought back a lot of old hollywood cliches to do with disaster films you had the sort yeah. of the ticking clock, yeah. the tall building on fire, uh, the solo hero who's kind of like a renegade, like a, not a renegade, but like a a cop with a chip on his shoulder. Uh, you had the the villains who were from some European country and not American, because you know why would they be? Uh, <laughs> obviously, feature film Hollywood debut of Alan Rickman. Uh, before then, he he was forty one at the time. Before then, he'd only ever been on stage and on British television. So he oh, was really well. nervous about his first Hollywood role, uh, but his outstanding success as Hans Gruber secured a very lucrative career in film for him. But yeah, it really did put a lot of Hollywood tropes back on the map, you know, like the ticking clock and everything. And it's yeah. it's a great film. And I think uh doesn't do it in a, I would argue it doesn't do it in a cheap way or a too nostalgic way either. It's quite fresh. Yeah, I think that's probably why it's endured, really, because it's mm. um, it's a fresh take on those things, but it's also similar enough to action movies at the time. But mm-hmm. it's it's like so well written as well. Like, I mean, because some there's kind of a bit of a prejudice against action movies and, uh, sometimes. Yeah, but um, Die Hard is so perfectly plotted, and the characterization of uh, McLean is just so good as well. Like his mm-hmm. his own personal problems and things. It's just it's such a it's such a well rounded film. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, uh, anyone who's a fan of Brooklyn Nine Nine will know of the the main character's obsession with Die Hard. So much so that uh, Die Hard's um, box office has actually been given a little bit of a boost because loads of people are starting to rent it on oh, Amazon nice. and they're buying copies of it on Blu-ray just because they want to see what all the fuss is about. And I think there is talks now that Brooklyn Nine Nine has become this huge sitcom. Uh, with a lot of success, that they want to get Bruce Willis in for a special episode. Oh, nice. Uh, so which I think would be... That, uh, yeah. The episode, I think it's a Christmas episode sometime where him, uh, Jake, Gina and Charles get trapped in a... Exactly, yeah. There we go. Center, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. And so, it's uh, literally the plot, isn't it, of Die Hard? Yeah. Not, not I, I always uh, like it. and well, I always find it really interesting when new franchises breathe new life into older things yeah. i think yeah. uh i think something like stranger things really paved the way for a lot of new stephen king adaptations because his books are you know a lot of the time are to do with you know child horror uh, and obviously Ooh. 80s music and 80s fashion it's all really come back into the spotlight because of something as big as stranger things yeah, yeah. there's been a yeah. revival hasn't there but, yeah yeah like a, yeah. Like a renaissance really isn't it of, of yeah yeah of, of genre, so I, I would definitely say uh, Brooklyn Nine Nine has helped Die Hard get a bit, a little bit more popular to a new generation of people who may have not seen it. Yeah, uh, it's been a while since I've watched it. To be fair, yeah, I think the last time I watched it was on the on the big screen somewhere. I can't remember where, but that was cool. On, the, really big screen. on the big screen. <laughs> You've watched and, a lot uh, of. Kind of um, sorry, go on. Sorry. I was going to say we should move on to Connor's Muppets. <laughs> okay. Con- uh, Connor's right. Muppets. Connor, I'll, I'll I'll set you a challenge here. You've go tried on. your hardest to worm the Muppets Christmas Carol into this festival. You put your heart yeah. and soul into making sure that we talk about it. I'm going to give <laughs> you sum up sum up the film in one sentence. Like it, 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 your your opinion on the film in one sentence, if you love it so much, and you've clearly oh, thought so my, you've clearly thought okay. about it. Yeah, yeah. So my opinion, not like not like a synopsis in one sentence. No, 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 no. Like no. My, my review sort of thing. God, you really put me on the spot because you didn't ask me this before. <laughs> I know. <laughs> right. Okay. I would say it is a heartfelt musical tale. Which breathes new life into classic literature. Oh, that's that's fit. Okay. 
That should yeah. be on the front of the, the Blu-ray release. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, on the back, you know, and sometimes they'll put a quote from the critics. It'll just say yeah, that, yeah. and it'll say Connor Scholl. Yeah, yeah. Can you imagine? I'd, I'd, make my, I'd make my life. That'd be great. <laughs> I thought you were going to say make my Christmas. No, it was going to make his life. Wow. <laughs> Quiet year, is it, Connor? <laughs> yeah. So obviously, I haven't seen uh, Muppet's Christmas Carol, but I know, Charles, you have. Yeah. It's uh, one of those. Um, my grandma, when we used to go around, me and Karen, who's my cousin, uh, when we were younger, she had about like two films on. VHS. One of them was Jurassic Park, and oh, the other nice. was um, Muppets Christmas Carol. So yeah, I watched it a few times, to say mm. the least. <laughs> <laughs> did it used to, Did it used to freak you out as much as it freaked me out as a kid? Some of the bits in it, or was I just really soft? I think you, you might have been a bit <laughs> soft, mate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. What, what freaked you out about it? I'll put it this way for Joe because Joe hasn't seen it. So obviously, there's the three the three ghosts of uh, Scrooge's. Well. Christmas past, present, and future. Mm-hmm. And the ghost of Christmas future is basically just a faceless Grim Reaper who doesn't talk. He just he just holds points. out his like ghastly fingers and points yeah. at things. It's so it's so creepy. <laughs> I'll have to check it out. Maybe I'll watch it it's one of these next nights. <laughs> yeah, it's on. Uh, if you have access to a certain popular streaming service endorsed by a mouse, then you could watch it on that. <laughs> <laughs> That's <amazing>. Not sponsored. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, not in any way. But uh, this certain mouse, if you do want to sponsor us, then get in touch. <laughs> yeah. At, at Show Media on Twitter, please. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Send us a DM. DM us. <laughs> if, you, if you sponsor us, I won't talk about my hatred for a lot of your business practices. <laughs> <laughs> All opinions are Connors and not the uh, representation of Shoal Media as I yeah. think. Maybe maybe <laughs> we'll uh, we'll have a maybe we'll have a Big Mouse Ears festival next year. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Only if they sponsor us. Only so. if they sponsor us. <laughs> uh, do you mean do you mean a Dead Mouse Festival? <laughs> there we go, yeah. We'll just get on <laughs> yeah, and just yeah. listen to some ravey music. Yeah, Amazing. yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> well, I mean, there we go, chaps. We've reached the end of the festival. That's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's gone pretty quickly really it has, it has. It obviously has. we have pre-recorded this one so uh from our perspective we've still got one more podcast to go and we also have a live watch along other film as well which by now you will know is which i'm uh, sure went very well yeah i mean what <laughs> what, what is the film it's Donny darko yeah no, yeah okay. oh yeah they, they'll know that by this point exactly yeah, exactly it's pre-recorded yeah, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So we really hope you enjoyed our, our watch along of Donnie Darko last week. Wink, wink. Um, and the uh, the Richard Linklater series. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I'm actually I'm looking forward to that. It's it's hard to pre-record something. My brain is it's time time, time and moments in passing. It. You know, it's uh, <laughs> trust us to do a pre-recorded podcast for a film festival about time. Yeah, I was just about to say that it's very uh, yeah. meta. That isn't it. Uh, <laughs> Well, obviously, um, this is going to be it for a little while. So we want to wish all of our listeners a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Shoal will be back in the new year at some point. Uh, we will be planning another film festival down the line, but we'll also be planning some less big things, you know, some more casual yeah. podcasts. And yeah. uh, we'll look to branching out maybe into some more visual media. Uh, and maybe we'll be taking on uh, a new member or two as well. So exciting things to come. So do make sure you stay tuned. You can watch all of our previous awesome. podcasts on the channel. Um, Follow our Twitter for yep. the updates. There's Follow our Twitter. Where they'll be. Click on the logo. We will be updating our website uh, with any new events that are coming, any new links. Oh, yeah. Also, yeah. whilst we're not doing any film festivals, we also have a blog on the website and you can read some some uh, some bollocks that's coming out of our brains <laughs> <laughs> if you want to check that out. But nice do give us a follow. Again. Give us a support. We should probably say thank you again to Emerson and Elliot. Absolutely. Oh, the, yeah. Uh, no, thank you. Thank the, you so uh, much, yeah. All the uh, technical side of stuff. Absolutely. Um, yep. But most importantly, thank you, everyone listening. Yep. Thank watching. you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Uh, Thanks. It's, it's, it's been really good. It's been and a lot thank of fun you, and... you chaps as well. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Too. yeah. That's, that's thank you, us. Ourselves. <laughs> good we've been. <laughs> Weren't we great? <laughs> And hopefully we'll be a bit more professional next time. But don't get your hopes up. 
Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't, don't, don't promise anything. Yeah. <laughs> a, uh, a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year from us at Shoal to all of our listeners. And uh, thank you and have a great Christmas. Merry Christmas, guys. Merry Christmas. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.